So let me start by asking you a question. If you knew that you had something that could save somebody's life, would you give it to them? If you knew that you had something that could save somebody's life, would you give it to them? For most of us, it's a no-brainer, right? I mean, without a second's thought, we would do it. We'd give them the very thing that we thought, man, if I, could, if I knew that that was going to save your life, we'd just give it to them, wouldn't we? Not even any hesitation. There wouldn't really be any question about it. What if I told you this morning that you do? You have something that could save somebody's life, literally. Amen? You have something that if you were willing to share it, could change the course of somebody's life forever. You've got it already. And that something is God's story and how it's impacted your life. Amen? That something is God's story, your story, where your, your story intersects with God's story. That story can save somebody else's life. Amen? So here's the question. Are you sharing it with them? Are you sharing it with them? We're in the middle of a sermon series that we call Growth Tracks, and what we're trying to do over the next several weeks is we're trying to equip one another in this room with the tools that we need to be the best follower of Jesus that we can be. Amen? How many of you want to be the best follower of Jesus that you can be? Your hand better go up right now. Unless it's broken, then you get off, you get off the hook. All right? Even then, you better make the effort, right? Every one of us is called to be, the, to be a follower of Jesus, to give ourselves fully and completely over to Him. And so we, we started by defining what it was to be a disciple. And we said that disciples of Jesus are somebody who do what Jesus says and what Jesus does. Disciples of Jesus do what Jesus says and they do what Jesus does. And then we took a look at this model. Maybe you remember this picture. How many of you remember seeing this picture? This is called the discipleship wheel, and at the top it says that the obedient Christian, and what it could say is, the obedient Christian does these things. Jesus is at the center of the obedient Christian's life, amen? And last week we talked about prayer. Do you remember? We focused on prayer last week, and we said that prayer has the power to bring peace and to change things and to draw us closer to God, and then we walk step by step through a way to practice prayer so that we could experience the power of of prayer in our lives. Amen? So let me ask you, how many of you experienced the power of prayer in a, in a really powerful way this week? Anybody in this room? Awesome. Share us, just tell me one thing that God did. Anybody, pop it up there. All right, praise God. And it's an answer to prayer, bud, right? Praise God. That's awesome. Anybody else? Just a quick one. Go ahead. Yeah. Does that mean God healed her? All right. Praise God for healing. Thank you. Sam, go ahead. Awesome. Somebody say amen to that. That's so good. Marlene. So in other words, God brought her back home or back here because he's not done with her. Is that what you're trying to say? Okay. That, those are good examples. One more right here, Becky. He got you here today. Somebody say praise God for that. How many of you are glad you're here this morning? Me too. So this week, I've been praying for God. I've been praying actually much longer than this week, but particularly this week, I've been praying for God. Let me finish, Melody, before you laugh at me. <laughs> I've been praying for God to show me what it looks like to experience more of Him. Somebody told me, I've heard it many times in my life, 
that I was missing out on everything that God wanted to be in me. That God wanted to, to fill me up even more. He wanted to come in and live in me even more. And I didn't understand that. I was frustrated by it because the reality is that as Christians, what we believe is that when the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us, He is fully there. Somebody say amen. amen. He's there, right? I was frustrated because as I thought about this, as I thought about the fact that I've committed my life to follow Jesus, that as I'm trying to be his follower, all of his power, all of his wisdom, all of his guidance is alive inside of me, but I keep hearing people say, you can have more. Well, that doesn't even make sense to me. And so I'm, I'm praying, God, if you're, if you're fully alive in me already, then what's it mean that, that there could be more? I'm missing something. Show me. This past week, I was talking with a friend, and just coming, right, I'm sitting here talking to John, and we're talking away, and we're talking away, and all of a sudden, right out of my mouth, the word submission pops right out. I hadn't planned to say submission. It just came. You ever had that experience where you felt like a two-by-four just whacked you right upside the head? Somebody say amen if that's you. The word submission hadn't even got out of my mouth, and I got smacked with a two-by-four, right? Because right in that moment, it occurred to me, what if I'm missing on the more that God wants to give me, the more of God that wants, the, the more that God wants to unleash inside of me because I haven't fully submitted my life to Him in some area? What if it's true? that I'm holding on to some area of my life that I want my way? What if it's true that I'm holding on to something because it's comfortable for me, even if it's not good for me? What if I'm holding so stubbornly on to some area of my life that the Holy Spirit can't unleash the more He wants to unleash in me? What if submission is the key to experiencing more of Him? Now, this isn't a brand new revelation to me. I've, I've thought it before. But it reminded me, as I'm looking around and I'm trying to figure out what this more is all about, that the, that the question I've been asking over and over again got the answer when that word submission came out of my mouth, right? And now I'm not on the journey to figure out what more means any longer, but now I'm trying to figure out how to let go so that God can do what He wants to do in me and through me more fully. Amen? Amen. All of that happened in prayer this week. That's a lot of stuff happening in prayer. Amen? Amen? Thank you, Lord, for the power of prayer at work in our lives when we're using it as a tool in our lives. Amen? God wants to have a rich, meaningful relationship with us, and He's inviting us into that relationship with Him, and He wants to show us power, and He wants to reveal new truths to us, and He can only do that when we're people of prayer. Disciples, followers of Jesus, are people of prayer. Amen? Now, this morning I want to shift the focus. Can we go back to the wheel for a second, Michaela, if that won't throw you totally off? Awesome. Look at her. Give her a hand back there. She's rocking it. If you look at the wheel, one of the spokes is prayer. We're going to move to the left and we're going to look at witnessing today. Somebody say witnessing. A follower of Jesus, a disciple, is a witness. Now, what's a witness? A witness is somebody who sees something and says something. That's pretty simple, right? A witness is somebody who sees something and says something. They observe something happening, then they tell somebody about it. If you've ever watched a courtroom drama, then you've seen how this unfolds, right? I mean, a witness gets called to the stand to testify to the fact that something happened or it didn't happen based on what they observed, and then based on their testimony and their witness, the judge and the jury make decisions, right? That's how this works. And it's exactly what we're talking about when we talk about being a disciple of Jesus and how we're called to be his witness. A follower of Jesus has a story to tell. Somebody say amen. amen. If you're following Jesus, if Jesus has done something in your life, then you have a story to tell, and you're supposed to be telling it. So what's stopping you? A follower of Jesus has a witness and a story to tell. They have a testimony about how God has rescued them from their old life and made them a new creation. And it doesn't really matter how good or bad that life was before. According to Romans chapter 3, we have all sinned. Somebody say all sinned and fallen short of God's standard for us, right? Every single one of us. You have, I have, 
Those people that you thought were the, were the cream of the crop, they've all sinned. Amen? It doesn't matter how good they think they are or how much good they think they've done or how much good you think you've done. You have all, we have all sinned and fallen short of God's standard for us. Amen? All of us. We've all sinned. And sin, at its core, is disobedience to God. Sin, at its core, is disobedience. Anything that you do or that you don't do that is not in line with the Bible and what the Bible instructs us to do and how to live our lives is sin. Somebody say, "Uh uh-oh. Yeah. So let me give you some examples just in case we're not clear about this. How many of you had trouble loving your neighbor this week? Anybody? Turn to your neighbor and say, sin. How many of you had some trouble allowing, uh, well, maybe you didn't have trouble with this. Maybe you did it quite freely, as a matter of fact. How many of you allowed anger to control your thought life at all this week? Anybody? Can, can we just say sin? How many of you got caught up in gossip sometime this week? Anybody? What was that, Mike? Sin. That's exactly right. You got the idea, right? Now, I'm just scratching the surface. If you look at Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21, which is on the screen, but it's also in your bulletin, what you'll find is if you read that list, there's a whole bunch of sin listed there. And here's the deal. Once you read through the list, you'll find yourself on the list somewhere. Somebody say amen. And if you don't, you're not looking hard enough. (laughs) Because we're all guilty of at least one of these, and I'm guessing multiple of these over the course of our lives, right? Sin, at its core, is disobedience to God, right? And according to Romans chapter 6, the wage for our sin is death. Somebody say death. Now, this seems kind of dark, right? We're we're all like, man, where's he going with this? Because I don't like this at all, right? The wage for our sin, what we've earned because of our sin, is death. That's what we deserve. How many of you all know there's good news, though? The good news is that Jesus brought a cure, right? He offered himself to take the place of our sin so that we could be healed and set free and made right with God, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. And when you come to realize what you've done, and when you wake up to how far you've strayed and how bad life has become for you, right, then you realize something has to change. And when you come to the realization that something has to change, you realize that something can change because of what Jesus has done. And when you make the decision to follow Jesus, guess what? Everything changes. Now, I'm not telling you you're going to win the lottery tomorrow because you follow Jesus. So don't go buy a ticket, all right? And I'm not telling you that everything's going to be roses and lollipops tomorrow. Somebody say amen. Amen. Because if you've lived this life with Jesus for very long, you know it's not always roses and lollipops. But let me tell you what changes in your life. All of a sudden, you discover a meaning and a purpose you never know you had. Right, Sam? All of a sudden, you recognize what it means to really be free. Somebody say amen. Amen. You know what real forgiveness looks like and feels like because you've experienced it for yourself. The pain that you lived through all of a sudden has a purpose behind it. And when you make the decision to follow Jesus, you become a brand new creation. Somebody say amen. Amen. The old has gone, and the new has come. And what happens when you get something new, church? Two things usually happen. Number one, you get rid of the old. Get rid of that old. Don't hold on to it. All right? The second thing that always happens is that you can't wait to tell somebody about the new thing. Somebody say amen. That is your witness. Look at what just happened. This is where your story, the story of a life of sin and brokenness and addiction and fear and hopelessness and God's story, the story of a love and a grace that's bigger than all of it, they collide. And when they collide, church, he rescues us. Amen? And when they collide, he sets us free. And when they collide, he heals us. And when he collide, he makes us new and whole again. He gives us a hope that we long for. Church, that is your witness. And that story will save somebody's life. Your story will save somebody's life, but here's the key. 
you got to share it with somebody. Amen? you got to share it with somebody. Now, beside the fact that Jesus commands us to be a witness, remember back in Matthew 28, Jesus comes to the disciples and he says, go. Somebody say, go. Go. That is not a suggestion. <laughs> right? Jesus commanded us to go. He said, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. Right? Go out and make disciples. And then he says, he repeats essentially in Acts chapter 1, verse 8 to the disciples. He says, you will be my witnesses. And he gives them the scope. And you know where the scope is? The whole world. You're going to preach the gospel. You're going to tell my story to the world. And you won't be able to help yourself because it's going to change you from the inside out. Somebody say amen. Besides the fact that we're commanded to be as witnesses, the knowledge that your story, your witness is going to save somebody's life ought to compel you to tell the story. Amen? So I ask again, are you telling the story? Are you bearing witness to the power of God's love in your life? Somebody is depending on you, and you need to tell them. Here's what I want to do right now. I want you to take a moment, and I want you to close your eyes right where you're sitting. And I want you to ask God this question. God, can you please show me who it is that needs to hear my story right now? I'm trusting that God is giving you a name. He's imprinting a name on your heart right now. I want you to write that name at the top of your sermon notes page right now. Just write the name down. For the rest of the message this morning, I want you to keep that person in your mind because their life, if God gave them to you, is likely hanging in the balance. And your story might just be the story that saves them. Your story might be the story that sets them free. Your story might be the story that helps them to discover the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God that you've experienced. Write that name down. Now, we got a few more minutes here. And in the next few minutes, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you some really practical things that you can do to get ready to tell your story because God is going to open the floodgates of opportunity for you to tell somebody about what he's done for you. So what do we do? Before you ever speak a word, there's some things you ought to do to prepare, and here's the very first thing you ought to do. You need to pray daily for yourself and for other people, specifically for the other people that God's put on your heart, right? We believe in this church and the power of prayer. We heard stories, just brief ones today, about how God answers the prayers that we pray, right? That when we ask Him to show us, He shows us that He changes circumstances and situations. He's still in the business of healing people. Amen? Amen. And if that's true, if we believe that there's power in prayer, then the most important thing that we can do is to be in prayer. Pray for God to guide you and to give you wisdom about what to say. Pray that God will give you the right opportunity to say it. Pray for the person that their heart will be open to receive it. Pray daily for you and for them. Before you ever say a word to anybody, second thing you can do before you ever say a word is live a consistent Christ-centered life yourself. How many have ever been around somebody who told you one thing and did something completely different? How many of you have been that person before? Go ahead. We're all about confession here, right? We've all been there, haven't we? How does it make you feel to hear from somebody and to know they're doing something else? What do, you, what do you think about the words that they're saying? You don't really trust them, do you? It's the same way with your witness. It's way more important how you are living than what you're saying. Did you hear that? Way more important how you're living than what you're saying. Now, that doesn't get you off the hook. You still need to tell them. But until you live a life that's worthy, until you live a consistent Christ-centered life yourself, whatever you have to say to them is a waste of breath. Amen? I love how Jesus says it. He says in Matthew chapter 5, verse, beginning of verse 13, he says, You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It's going to be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. But instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everybody in the house. Makes sense, doesn't it? Verse 16, in the same way, 
Let your good deed shine out for all to see. Notice Jesus does not say, let your words shine out for all to see. Notice he doesn't say, let your sermon stand out for all to see. Right? Because nobody cares what you say until they see you living it yourself. He says, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everybody will praise your heavenly Father. If you are living a consistent Christ-centered life, then you better believe that people are going to notice because it's rare today. Amen? People are watching. And they notice and they want to know more when they see it. They will see your good works and they will give praise to God and they will start asking the question, what's different about you? Now, here's what else you can do before you ever say a word. You can open your ears and listen. Another old adage I want to share with you. Well, first of all, you earn the right to be heard when you listen to other people and you build relationships with them, don't you? Now how it works. Now, you've heard this before probably, but if you haven't, it's a, it's a good nugget for you to write down. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. You heard that before? People don't care what you know until they know that you care. How many of you think that's true? I believe it from the bottom of my heart. You will never be heard until you hear other people. Your willingness to listen and to care and to invest in the lives of somebody else opens the door for them to open their lives to you. It does. You know it from your own experience, right? You've been there yourself. Who are the people who tr that you trust? Who are the people that you confide in? Most of those people are people who earned your trust by doing what? They listened to you. They invested in you. They cared for you. And now you listen to them. They've earned the right to speak into your life, church, and, and you do the same thing if you're willing to take time to listen and to build a relationship. Here's the last thing you do before you ever say a word. Realize that people are looking for a cure. How many of you sometimes find yourself afraid to share your story with somebody because you don't want to meddle? Anybody ever done that before? Yeah. I don't want to cry. Man, I don't know if I want to go there. I don't, man, it's, this is personal. They don't need to. It's none of my business what they think. Have you ever been there? Yeah. We've all done it. Let's just be honest about it. Even those of us who are super extroverted, right? When it comes to things of God, I don't know why, but we get terrified. Right? We get all bollocked up. We're like, I, I don't know. I, don't, I want to say the right thing. Or maybe, maybe they, they've probably heard it before. We've used that excuse too, haven't we? The truth is that when people go to the doctor, they don't walk in the door and go, hey, doc, I got cancer, do they? You know why? Because they don't know they have cancer. What they know is they've got symptoms. What they know is that they're hurting, that something is wrong. They have symptoms. That's where most people live. They see symptoms. They have pain. I'm lonely. I'm suffering from a broken relationship. I'm stressed out. I'm feeling anxious. I'm depressed. There's darkness inside of me that I don't know what to do with. They've got all these symptoms, and you know what they do? They start chasing after what? The cure. What are they looking for? They want the cure. Unfortunately, in their pursuit of the cure, it, they find themselves running after things that only serve to mask the pain, right? They go after drugs or, or food or unhealthy relationships or shopping or a fill in the blank, right? But what they're looking for, just like what you and I were looking for, is the cure. And we know the cure. Somebody say amen. Church, we've got the cure. We know that Jesus is the cure. And he didn't die to ease their symptoms. He died to take away their disease. Somebody say amen. amen. He died to heal them. He died to set them free. He died so they didn't have to go back to drugs and alcohol and food and unhealthy relationships and pornography and, and shopping and slander and fear. He died so that they could have the cure. And the only way they receive knowledge that there is a cure is when we tell them. Amen. And that takes us to this. You've done some prep work, right? Up to this point, if you're doing all those things, you're trying to get ready to tell your story, but now you've got to go out there and do it. Somebody comes to you and says, man, your light's shining so bright. Tell me about that. Right? There's something different about you. I want to know what you know. You've got to be able to tell your story. Inside your bulletin, what I want you to do is I want you to pull out the sheet that says, what's your story on the top of it? Just pull it out. And on the top of it, if you didn't already, I want you to write the name of the person that a few minutes ago God put on your heart. Write their name at the top of that piece of paper. Now, there are three questions on this piece of paper. And quickly, let's run through them. It says, 
First of all, who was I before I had an encounter with Jesus? I want you to think for a moment about the life that you used to live. If you're a follower of Jesus, there was a time before you were following Jesus with your life, right? Now, it may have been subtle. It may not have been totally off the chain. But remember, all, somebody say all, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so whether you murdered somebody, I hope not, or you gossiped today, you've fallen short. Amen? Who, was you, who were you before you had an encounter with Jesus? That's part of your story. But it is not all of your story, amen? Because there's a time at, at some point along the way when you get to the question, what happened to show me that I needed to make a change? What was your rock bottom moment? What's that place in your life that you came to that you got, I cannot live like this anymore. Can you remember that spot? I can't live like this anymore. At some point along the way, you come to realize there's a better life, and that better life is with Jesus. Amen? And so that leads us to the third question. Who am I now that I've committed to follow my life to Jesus? How's my life different today than it was in the beginning because of what Jesus has done inside of me? That's your story. That's your story. I want you to take a few minutes this week. We're not going to do it right now because we'll, we, I don't know how long we're going to do this, how long it's going to take you. But I want you to take seriously this week, you've got homework. I want you to go home this week, and I want you to answer those three questions. And you can use this piece of paper, and you can use 46 others if you want. I don't care. As long as you accomplish the goal of answering these three questions for yourself. Now, on the back of that same sheet of paper at the bottom, it says, you see where it says our problem, and there's a cross in the middle? This is called the bridge illustration. For those of you who are looking for a tool to figure out how can I I explain to somebody about this sin problem that Pastor Jeff just talked about a few minutes ago. This is the gospel in a nutshell. How many of you know that God made you? Raise your hand if you know that. All right, good, very simple. How many of you know that God loves you with an everlasting love? He proved it over and over again, didn't he? How many of you know that at some point along the way, you, and if it wasn't you, then it was Adam and Eve, and then it came and it came and came and came, and everybody's done it ever since, fell short and sinned and disobeyed God? Everybody, right? We've all got this sin problem in our lives that led to a division in our relationship. I want you to think about what happens in a relationship that you have with somebody here on earth when you slander them. When you, when you punch them, when you steal from them, when it, whatever, whatever it is you've done, what happens? You draw a chasm between you and them, don't you? Now, it may not be irreparable, but something has to happen in order for it to be repaired, right? Right? Now, God looked down, and he saw this chasm between you and me. That's what this picture is all about. He saw the chasm, and he said, I love them, and I'm going to fix this. And in order to fix it, he sent Jesus. And Jesus gave his life on a cross so that the bridge could be built between our sin and our salvation. He sent his son, Jesus, to die on a cross, and all we have to do is repent of that sin and turn our hearts to Him. That's what this picture represents. That's the gospel in a nutshell. When my story and the gospel story collide, it has the power to change lives. When the service started this morning, you saw a video of my friend Curtis. I don't know if Curtis knew what he was doing when he got up there. He, in fact, he was, he was pretty scared. Can I just tell him that? Is that all right? He's pretty scared. He's like, dude, I've never been on video before, so I don't know about this. We did that whole shoot in 10 minutes. It was crazy. He said, you know what? At the end of the day, it was easy because it just came from my heart. And we didn't ask him these three questions exactly, but they were real close to that. And the bottom line was, that's Curtis's story in a nutshell. Here's who I was before. Here's what happened when I encountered Jesus, and here's what's happening in my life now. How many of you know that Curtis's story is saving lives today? There are lives changing, generations changing, because Curtis heard from God that God God opened the door for him to come and be in relationship with him. He made himself available, and then he began to tell the story to other people, and hundreds of other people have seen this story and have been touched by it. In fact, he told me the other day... Is this okay if I share this? 
He says to me the other day, he said, I, I got family who I haven't seen in years because they thought I was off the chain. And they didn't want any part of me. And they're showing up to parties now because they want to know what the heck is going on in my life. What is that about? What did Jesus say in Matthew 5, 16? He said, let your good deeds shine, shine out, so that what will happen? People will see it, and God will get the glory. Amen? And what's beautiful about my buddy Curtis is that that's exactly what's happening. People are seeing it. They're asking him about it. He said, let me tell you about Jesus and what Jesus is doing in me. That's how this works, church. That's how this whole thing works. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to imagine for just a moment that you've taken the time to do this. And God's laid a person on your heart. I want you to imagine that you share this story with them. What do you think might happen? You think so? God has a story. He's working through you. And when they see it coming out of you, when they hear it coming out of your mouth, when they see you living it every single day, they want to know what's going on. And when they hear from you about how God has changed your life, it will change their life too. Amen? That's why God put that person on your heart, because you have a story to tell them. And I believe that if you're obedient, that it'll change their life. So I want you to take seriously this week this idea of writing your story out. And then I want you to find a tr trusted Christian friend this week. Somebody in this room, somebody that goes to another church that you know, somebody who's walking this journey with you, I want you to take some time and I want you to go to them. I want you to say, listen, I feel like God's laid somebody on my heart that I need to share this story with. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. And let them walk with you through it. And then get ready because God's going to open the door. I want you to take that piece of paper and I want you to lift it up right now. And I want you to close your eyes. We're going to pray for the person and the message that God's going to put on your heart. But I also, I want you to know that this morning, if you're in this room and you heard this and you went, well, I don't, I mean, I got a personal story. I've got some junk, but I don't know if I've ever really gotten past who I was before an encounter with Jesus because I haven't had one yet. If that's you right now, I don't want you to leave here this morning without coming up and seeing me.